as we, we've been looking at Acts, what would seem to be to this point the message that Luke wants to communicate to his church? What, what does he want them to get? You can do it. Okay, you know, what would lead you to say that? What is it that Luke has done that would cause you to say he wants his church to say, man, we can do it? What has he done that would lead that, lead you to believe that? Well, he's told the story of how Jesus did it and okay. his disciples, you know, were able to do even things maybe greater than Jesus did okay. through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So he's told stories about how the church has been successful. Uh, Jesus was successful. The church has been successful. Okay. Um, so that's something that Luke wants his congregation, the people reading it, to take away. Any, anything else you think he wants his people to understand or start to believe or start to do? Based on what he has what he has said to this point. Keep on keeping going, I guess. Okay. You know. Keep keep moving on. Mm -hmm. What what has he done or or mentioned in what he's written that would cause you to say that? Just the way he goes on with, you know, telling what, what was done. And okay. How John baptized them with water, but you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And okay. And so we keep, to keep that focus as they move forward. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that's interesting because you, you also, in that example you gave, which was, I think, a good one to, to support what you were saying, that's also something else he may be wanting them to do uh, or wanting to convey to them. Uh, when he says, you know, John baptized with water, but the Holy Spirit, but you're going to be baptized with the Spirit. When he says things like that, what is he doing for his church? Encouraging them. Okay, he's encouraging them, you know, which is back to the sort of the, you can do it. What would, what's the situation in, in the early church? What's going on around, if we're looking at the turn of the first century, what's the situation faced by the early church? What are some of the, the problems, even if you didn't know the history of the early church, what would be some problems you would assume they'd be facing? Hmm. Persecution, persecution. Oh, okay, facing facing persecution. Okay. Well, not everybody read, so there was a lot of retelling of. Okay. Which I would have to think that that would be kind of like playing telephone. Good. Let's, let's go back to that because that's great, Jake. You said um, persecution. Mm -hmm. um, what would cause you to think that they they're facing persecution? Just the, just because I don't know. Just because uh, Luke's talking about it. Okay, Luke talks a lot about Christians being persecuted. Yeah, um, and and I just think all the you know everything he's saying is to you know reinforce and enrich what's mm -hmm. happening now. So saying Are you, you're probably facing this. It happened before. Okay. And tie it even farther back to Scripture. Okay. So this would be something that, again, would help them keep on going mm -hmm. because they know they, they face that kind of stuff or the church has endured that kind of stuff. You're not alone mm -hmm. in, in dealing with it. They're uh, linking stuff from the Old Testament, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How so? When, is, when are they claiming... Or when does when is Luke pointing to the Old Testament? Well, when I think when Peter speaks, I feel like okay, he, he starts with you know the sermon, mm -hmm. and the sermons are always the same. Mm -hmm. They always talk about Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Always talk about stuff that went on. That Jesus is a fulfillment. Mm -hmm. 
or there's a continuity. There isn't anything, this isn't new. This, in fact, is, is really, really old. Uh, it goes right back to the beginning. Now, that's, that's interesting, and I, don't, I want to go back to what you were saying, Donna. Uh, that's interesting, too, that he uses the Old Testament. What does that tell you about his community, that he uses the Old Testament so much? They're versed in it. They, they must, understand okay. it. Which means they are probably... What's that? Well, they certainly, that's, that's really good, Ed, because he, he writes, and I think I've said that before, he writes in a very sophisticated Greek. He is, is a well-educated, structurally is, is really good. That's what makes him hard to translate, because his, he is so good, and his vocabulary is so varied. He uses words that other, other uh, writers in the New Testament don't use. Uh, it, so it's it's very very good. So he's probably he's certainly speaking to Greek speakers because if this were your second language, you couldn't understand it. It's it's too difficult to to understand just because it's so good. Uh, but he also uses Old Testament images, which means he's using this very sophisticated Greek, but but using Old Testament images. Therefore, he must be using it because it's meaningful to the people. I mean, if he was writing to pure Gentiles, why use Old Testament images? They don't. They wouldn't get it. They wouldn't get it okay uh, about it, which is one of the things we see in Romans. As Paul's writing to a principally Gentile community, he has to, uh, he doesn't lift up the Old Testament because it doesn't mean anything to him. You know, he's, he's going to talk about other things. Uh, so, so we've got this. So we know something about his community. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Donna, you said that in when I, when I asked about the early church, mm -hmm. you said it's like playing telephone. Mm -hmm. How how is it like playing telephone? Well, little things get twisted around or misunderstood or okay. misconstrued or comes out wrong, and so therefore you would just kind of get. Not a pure version of it. Okay. Yeah. And, and what you're saying, too, is even if the intention is good, mm -hmm. even if we were really wanting to communicate this message, because this is the message we believe, if we have 30 people in a circle, even if this is what I want person 30 or 29 to get, it's still going to be distorted mm -hmm. with our best effort. You know, if you're talking about a dynamic situation where everybody may not be motivated, have the same motives, or may have a very different message that they have adopted, you've got to, you, you need to have, and, and it's all oral. You don't have stuff written down because writing is too expensive. Wouldn't make any difference because most people can't read it because there's nothing to read. It. So, so much of it is oral. Lord have mercy, you're going to have a, a lot of little differences, big differences. And so some of this may be Luke instructing his church, this is what's appropriate. Man, Paul does that in every letter he writes. Mm -hmm. This is what you're supposed to believe. Not that and not that, but this. This is what's true. And so Luke is, is susceptible, e even if we look at the beginning of both Luke and Acts, it says it's written to a person with an odd name, Theophilus, God's friend, friend of God. Uh, but it's, it's so that you have an orderly, you have an understanding, an orderly account of what happened, which is exactly what you were saying. Let me, let, you got a lot of stuff floating out there, let me give you the truth. Let me give you what's, what's true. And, and that sure seems to be what, what Luke is, is doing in his work. Okay, important to know, I think it's important to know something about the audience that's receiving it because we get the intention of the writer. And if we can sort of put ourselves in their position and hear it through their ears, all of a sudden the lessons that Luke is conveying to them we can understand, not just the words, but also maybe the motivation behind it. And even if our situation isn't the same, we can at least understand what he's trying to say to them and might have, through that have an application. 
Okay, so we've got Luke writing this to, to an interesting church. By this time, he we see the church growing, right? And where has it grown? The end of the earth. It's, it's about to go to the ends of the earth. And we've got the guy that's going to do it, right? And it's going to be? Saul. Saul. Uh, we, so we got the guy that's going to do it. We've got permission to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the permission? When did we see that permission given? Wasn't given to Saul. It was given through the Holy Spirit. Well, right. The whole Holy Spirit's always acting here. What is the human being that really got the the go? Cornelius. Well, it was Cornelius who was the first Gentile, but who was the one that brought who was the one that included Cornelius into the community? Who baptized Cornelius? Because this becomes important as to again to understand how Luke is seeing things. He's writing sixty years after Peter. this is happening. Ah, it's Peter. Because Peter is for Luke, who is Peter? The rock. He's the rock. Absolutely. He's the one on which this church is built. So important things. That, Everything to this point. Peter led the disciples in Jerusalem. After Stephen went to Judea and Samaria, Peter followed him. And now Peter is the one we've got Saul. We know he's going to take it to the ends of the earth, but it's going to start with Peter. So Peter is involved in all of these things. And we're going to really focus on one of the last stories involving Peter in the book of Acts in chapter 12. So we're ready to we're ready to go, but we haven't started yet. In chapter 12, verse 1, who was introduced? Herod. Okay. And Herod is a king. king. Now, who is this guy? Who is Herod? Is he the one that wanted Jesus killed? Or is that a different Herod? You know, Herod is tricky mm -hmm. because the old man Old man Herod, the granddaddy of them all. He was a little like uh, uh, George Foreman. A little bit like George Foreman. Mm. Mm. George 1, 2, 3. What's that? George 1, 2, 3. Yes. Herod one, George, two, three. George named all his kids. George, George uh, 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 Foreman named all his kids George. Mm -hmm. And that's what Herod did. Uh, Herod had a bunch of Herods. And, and even a daughter named Herodias. So Herod loved Herod, the name Herod. So there's a lot of Herods floating around. And you, these were half-brothers and sisters because Herod had more than one wife. And so they were children from, from different, different wives. So you, you had, that's why, and they, they intermarried. That's why Herodias married, you know, Philip and later Herod. Uh, so Herod, which, which, you know, is what they did in the ancient world to keep the bloodline pure. You know, you, the way to keep it from being polluted is make sure you married your half cousin or maybe even better, like, uh, like Cleopatra and, uh, and Ptolemies in Egypt, you marry your brother. And then you're guaranteed to keep the bloodline pure. That's, that's what they did, and that's why they ended up being the mess that they were. Uh, so, anyways, we got Herod introduced. Now, this Herod, we we've got several. We've talked about several Herods. You mentioned one, the one that was involved in the crucifixion. Uh, that was, and and it's interesting. That's only in the Gospel of Luke, which kind of connects it here. His name it was Herod Antipas, Herod Antipas, and he wasn't a king. He was called what was called a tetriarch. One of the things, and now his daddy was Herod, who was called Herod the Great. Herod the Great. And Herod the Great became, he was a king and became a client king with the Romans. What the Romans wanted to do is the Romans wanted to have kings ruling areas within their empire. They didn't want to rule it directly because ruling it directly cost money. That was more expensive. You know, ruling an area yourself, you had to you have to pay to collect garbage. You know, you gotta pay for everything. You get a king 
to rule the area and make sure he's paying taxes. Lord have mercy. You know, you don't have to do that petty stuff. You know, he'll take care of it. And that's the Romans were really big on having these client kings. And, and Herod the Great was a client king. The trouble with Herod the Great was he, when he was an old man, he got very jealous and insecure. And he was the one that was at the, the story of Jesus. You know, he was killed at the murder of the innocents. And, and that was Herod the Great. He became very insecure. And so any of his children that he perceived as a threat, he killed them. So he killed any of his children that he perceived as a threat. And if he perceived them as, as a threat, they were probably the ones who had the most yeah, talent. Oh. They were the best and the brightest of the kids because the best and the brightest were the threat. So the ones that were left that Perry didn't see as threats were not the sharpest knives in the drawer. And, and so when he died, uh, you had a lot of questionable descent. And now the Romans weren't stupid. They didn't want somebody incompetent to rule an area because they needed the tax money. So instead of making some, one of Herod's sons a king to rule Herod's kingdom as a client, you know, ruling it as a, as a client, he, they, he, the Romans broke his territory into three parts. And each one was ruled by a sub-king. They called them tetriarchs because that's somebody who real rules a third. Arch is the, the Greek word for king, ruler. So a tetriarch is like a third of a king. And you had three, he, they divided Herod's kingdom into three parts. And one of them was ruled by Herod Philip. And one was ruled by uh, Herod Antipas, which was Galilee, around Galilee. And one was ruled, the Palestine part, was ruled by a guy named Archelaus. And he's mentioned in, in Matthew. Uh, Archelaus was an idiot. He was an idiot that the Romans fired because he was so incompetent that the Romans couldn't trust him. So they shipped him off someplace else to be a little tetriarch where he couldn't cause damage. And Rome took over Judea. They were going to rule Judea directly. Uh, with, a, with a governor. But Herod Anipas is still hanging around in Galilee, and he's the one that goes to Jerusalem with Jesus. So the son is, is Herod Anipas. This one is Herod the Great's grandson, and his name was Herod Agrippa. Now, have you ever heard the name Agrippa before? He was, he was a Roman general and was very close to Augustus Caesar because he led uh, in Actium when the Romans defeated Mark Antony. You know, he was the, the general that led. And so what Herod did is he named his son Herod Agrippa after this Roman general as a way to put Print in white the job descript the uh, you know the job description on your application. That's what Herod did by naming his son Agrippa, because he was sucking up to the Romans. And Herod Agrippa was was raised in Rome. He wasn't raised in Palestine. So this is Herod Agrippa. But Herod Agrippa was really close to the Romans. And this is when the Emperor Claudius has power. And Claudius grew up with Agrippa. So they were, they were very, very close from, from childhood. Claudius made, instead of making Herod Agrippa a tetriarch, ruling uh, like his daddy's little kingdom, he made Herod king over, made him a true king over the area that Herod the Great ruled. So Herod Agrippa was, was a person to be reckoned with. He was, a, he was a pretty powerful person with good Roman connections. Okay, so that's the background. So we got King Herod. He's going to show up later uh, in, in Acts. Now, what is Herod doing to the church? He is, he is really after the church. In fact, what example does Luke give to show that he is really 
really hitting the church hard. Well, he killed James. Okay, he kills James, who is the brother of John. The brother of John. So this is James, the son of Zebedee, who Herod kills, one of the apostles, right? Now, what is Herod's motivation? In, in doing it. Probably to appease the scribes, I would feel like. Well, peace. Luke tells us, right? What does he say in verse 3? Mm -hmm. When he saw this pleased the Jews. So when, it pleased, when it pleased the Jews, you're right. He did it to, to please the Jewish leadership. Now, why, why was it so important for Herod to please the Jewish leadership? To keep well... Keep the peace. Please the leadership. You keep the peace. Romans don't like problems, don't like disturbances. Herod had a, a, a genuine problem being king of the Jews. And that's what he was called, king of the Jews. He had a real problem because Herod Agrippa and Herod Antipas and Herod the Great were not Jews. They weren't ethnic Jews. Uh, they weren't Jews by race. Now, they were Jews by religion, but they weren't Jews by race. They were called Edomians. They were Edomians. That was a tribe to the south of, of Judea, of, of what is Palestine. They were the descendants of the Edomites. And the Edomites were descendants, saw themselves as descendants of of, uh, of Esau, not of Jacob. The Jews were the descendants of Jacob. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. So Herod wasn't a Jew, but he was king of the Jews, which created a problem because the Jews, particularly the scribes, mm -hmm. Pharisees, and the Sadducees and the priests, they didn't like Herod at all. Not only because he was tax, he taxed them because he was, he was the, the guy the Romans used to pick up the money. But he wasn't a Jew. He wasn't one of them. And they knew it. And they reminded Herod. I think I told you the, the, one of the things the Sadducees did with Herod, and this is Herod Agrippa, is he built a palace close to the temple and had a dining hall on a second floor and could look down and see sacrifices because he couldn't go into the temple because he wasn't an ethnic Jew. And when the Sadducees saw that that's what he was doing, so he could predict, they built a wall to prevent him from being able to see. That's how serious they were in, in sort of excluding Herod. Now, Herod was a convert. He was a Jew by religion, but not by birth. So pleasing the Jews was a big deal. Seeing that persecuting them uh, Christians appease the Jews motivated him to do it. Now that I think is is important because it, it it does to Herod a little bit like what Luke has already done with Pilate, you know Pontius Pilate. You know he's doing it for political motivation, not because he hates Christians or hates Jesus. He's doing it because it helps him politically. So it's, it's bad, but not quite as bad as when Saul was breathing murder against Christians. Okay, so this is, this is Herod, and he's done a terrible thing to, to James. He's going to get his comeuppance later. And so what does Herod do? Since it pleases the Jews to persecute Christians, who does he go after? Peter. Peter. Why Peter? Peter. Be like getting the head. He is he is the head. Come he's the, the big head. he's the big guy. And when does he do it? Lord have mercy. When is he gonna do it? Passover. He's gonna do it Passover. Why would you do why would he choose? If if this is gonna please the Jews, why would he choose to go after the top guy at Passover? Doesn't it say that they were going to release him after Passover? But well, they're going to present him, right? right? Why would he? Why would he choose Passover? Because everybody would be gathered for. Yes, 
just like we saw at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. You know, you had, it said, you had Jews all, all over the place. You know, Passover, Jerusalem became a, a big city. So he's going to do it when more Jews can see it than not. You know, he doesn't want to do it on a, on a Friday afternoon. He wants to do it in the middle of the Passover festival where it's going to get a lot of play. And, and what does he do? Throws him in prison, right? Oh, that's him, throws him in prison, right? And he, he does what? As he throws him in prison, he puts a guard on him, right? Mm -hmm. But not just a guard. That's right. He's got, a, he's got a squad of soldiers watching him. And he's going to present him right after Passover, after the sacred ceremony, while the crowds are still there. This is a way that Pilate's going to, or Herod's going to get all kinds of PR, right? Mm -hmm. What does the church do? As Peter's in prison, we pray to God. okay, they start they start praying. Now, what is that showing? Because we we said early on about what is Luke trying to teach his church. Mm -hmm. What is this showing about the church? I think it might show they're afraid. Well, this church is is afraid. How are they dealing with their fear? And Luke's church is afraid, certainly. Mm -hmm. How is how is this ideal church? The perfect church, which is what Luke is presenting in Acts, how do they deal with stress? Pray, pray. They pray. Luke's church may deal with stress by complaining, whining, giving up, you know, doing stupid things. How does the church in Acts respond? Man, it prays. And in the book of in the gospel of Luke, prayer is a big deal to Jesus. You see it in all the other gospels as well, but in Luke, it's, it's mentioned more often that this is part of who Jesus is. He's one that prays in the church, does the exact same thing. Now, what is Peter's situation? So, so the church is responding to this crisis through prayer. What is Peter's situation? In jail. Well, the angel's coming. Well, He's even chained. before the angel. He is chained, right? Between two soldiers. Between two soldiers, and you got guards at the door. In other words, for Peter to get out of this, it would take a miracle, right? Or he'd have to be Houdini or something. He is not going to get out of that. You know, as Luke is writing it, he's setting us up, right? Mm -hmm. So we, the reader, kind of know what's going to happen, right? A miracle is going to take place. So what happens? An angel shows up. An angel shows up. Now, angels have shown up in other places in Luke and Acts, right? An angel shows up and we know it's an angel because Luke says what? A light, a light shone. So we not only is he called an angel of the Lord, but the light is there. And what does the angel say? Get up. Okay. Arise quickly. Arise quickly. Interesting though. Before the angel says, arise quickly, what does Luke tell us has, Peter is he, doing? He is sleeping. He's sleeping. Why? And, and I'm not, I don't know, I don't believe this is a major point. But Luke has Peter. He's in jail. He's between two guards. He's chained up. There are guards at the door. He knows that another one of the apostles has already been killed to satisfy the crowd. He's going to be dragged out as soon as Passover is over. But he is sleeping. What might Luke subtly be trying to convey about, about Peter and at least how Peter faces is facing this stress? He's at peace. He is at peace. Why would he be at peace? Because he feels that God's going to rescue him. Because he believes God is there. Or he's at peace with however it ends. However it is. But he, either way, Peter is not feeling stress. It's not like he was awake when the angel appeared. He, the angel has to wake him up for crying out loud. And the angel says, get out quickly. Now, clearly there's a problem with him getting out quickly, right? Mm -hmm. He's... Well, handcuffs fall off. He's handcuffed, right? But the handcuffs fall off, right? Mm -hmm. 
Then what does the angel say? Get dressed. Put on your shoes. Get, your get dressed. Get your sandals on. And, and what does Peter do? Put on your coat. Did as he was told. Did as he was told. What does then the angel say? Put your coat. Get your coat on and follow me. And what does Peter do? He puts his coat on and follows him. What are we seeing about Peter here? He is, he is obedient, right? So not only was he able to sleep as his crisis was happening, because there was enough peace that he could do it, when the angel says go, Peter says, yeah boy, right? That's right. And, and what makes it maybe even more amazing that he is so obedient? What does Peter seem to assume, or, or what might he be thinking? Maybe things a dream. Yeah, he thinks it may all be a, be a vision. Okay, now what happens? So the, we got the angel, right? We got Peter, the clearly is from God because the chains fall off of him. Peter is following the angel. What ends up happening? The gate opens. The gate, they pass by the guards, right? Mm -hmm. The gate opens of its own mm -hmm. accord. Okay, and then what do they do? Street. They get on the street, and what occurs? What happens on the street? The angel, the angel, the angel disappears. Okay. Now, what then has occurred? A miracle. A miracle, right? A miracle has occurred. Now, is this the first kind of miracle like this we've seen? Heck, no. We've seen this happen before. Okay, but it's it it is certainly a miracle here. Okay. Now, why, why would Peter be freed? Why, why would this miracle take place? Why is this taking place? Because the church prays. Because the church prays, sure, the church prays. And it's not Peter's time. This isn't Peter's got other things he needs to do. Who is in control? God. God's in control of this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What happens to Peter? Well, he goes to the house of um, Mary. He does, but before he goes, what does Luke tell us? Well, he considers this to be a miracle. In case we had any doubt about it being a miracle, it was. It was because who says it was a miracle? Uh, Peter says it was a miracle. You know, he comes to himself and he says exactly the interpretation we would make, right? So Luke tells us how we're supposed to read this story by what Peter just said. Now, Peter goes, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes to a house. What house does he go to? Um, Mark's mother, Mary. Okay, he goes to Mary and Mark. Now, have we seen Mark before? And no. Will we see him again? Yes, Mark's going to play a role in the story. This is something Luke has done before. He's dropped in a name, and we see that. In, and gosh, we see it in the Bible. We see it in literature. Mm -hmm. You drop in a name like when he talked about Saul, you know, when they were stoning Stephen, just drop Saul in. Oh, by the way, the guy watching the coats was named Saul. You know, never saw him before. Wasn't important in the story. Wasn't important in that story. Mark, John Mark is not important in this story but it'll be important later. So Luke is kind of dropping that name in, okay? And what are they doing? Of course, what are they doing at Mary's house? Well, she opens her house for Christians all the time to have. Yes. For meetings. And they're having meetings, and what are they doing at the meeting? Praying. Lord, have mercy. Of course they're praying. And what does Peter do? So that's the house. What does Peter do? Knocks on the door. Boom, 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 boom. Rhoda appears. Now, when I read that, you remember the... Now, see, I, I'm an old guy. You remember the, the, the little situation comedy? But the, 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 one of the characters was... What's his name? Was a doorman? You never saw him? He was only on the speaker? On the speaker yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, you know, so... Kind of like Wilson. Yeah, Wilson. yeah, yeah. But, he's, but he, he was just... You just heard his voice. Uh -huh. Yeah, like Wilson. The, um, the kind of something similar is here. You know, Peter's knocking at the door, right? Mm -hmm. And Rhoda comes to answer. And, and 
What's her response? Evidently, Peter must say something to her because Luke says, she what? <coughs> She's overcome with joy. Yeah, because she recognizes his voice, right? Mm -hmm. So she recognizes, so she doesn't open the door. She's, she just hears it. I, I'd like to come in. Whoa, that sounds like Peter. She's so overjoyed. She does what? She runs back. She runs back and announces that Peter's at the gate instead of opening the stupid door, right? So she runs, but Luke wants us to know that she's not doing it because she's stupid or angry or disappointed. She doesn't do it because she is so filled with joy. She is overjoyed at this that she doesn't even think about opening the door. Now, interesting, she's going to the other people, right? Mm -hmm. And they, she tells them that Peter is there. In a sense, what is she doing? Cottonwood Bible says, well, you're off your rocker. Well, that's the response. And, and that should cause us to feel a little deja vu because the same thing has happened before where a woman comes and brings a message. She, she's sharing a message, right? She's sharing good news. Resurrection. And they, ah, ha, 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 ha. The resurrection, the women, they come and tell the apostles that are gathered that Jesus was raised, and their response was, yeah right. yeah, right, the same thing, except, you know, Peter goes. Mm -hmm. So they say she's, she's wrong, mm -hmm. that it can't be. It must be a ghost. It's got to be uh, a ghost, or maybe it's, it may be an angel, right, a messenger from God that appears to look like Peter, like Peter okay? Now, by doing this exchange, by the people doubting her and saying it can't be Peter, it's impossible for it to be Peter, mm -hmm. what is Luke doing in this story? Like making it more exciting. Yes, he's making it more exciting. I'm one, building suspense. Like. One of the things that we, yeah, that's exactly what I think he's doing. He is writing a good story. story. In fact, it's, it's kind of interesting. In the, in the early church, and we're not talking about this early church, we're talking about like 150 years later, there are all kinds of stories like this floating around the early church. And a lot of them are adventure stories where the apostles do heroic things. You know, they fight dragons. And they, there's a, there's a story called uh, the Acts of Peter and Thelsa. And Peter, Paul, wrong, it's not Peter, Paul and Thelsa. And, and the, early, the church around the second century, they got to a point where they thought marriage wasn't a good thing uh, because procreation wasn't a good thing. You shouldn't have babies because babies are material and you know, you want to be spiritual, so you want to transcend that. So early church. And so Thelsa is, is married to a prince. That's what, she's a woman married to a prince. Oh, get, getting married to a prince. And um, she becomes a Christian. And when she becomes a Christian, under Paul's influence, of course, she does not want to have children. She wants to stay pure, stay a virgin. Because that's what... God wants, right? Well, her husband-to-be isn't keen on that. So what he does is he locks her in a tower. And who rescues her from that tower? Rapunzel. Oh, no, not Rapunzel. Who is climbing up her hair? It was Rapunzel. Oh, yeah, but it's Rapunzel's the girl with the hair. Yeah. Climbs oh. it. Yeah. The prince. Not the prince. Paul. Paul rescues, climbs into this tower, mm -hmm. is in the tower room with this princess who doesn't want to marry because she doesn't want to have children. And in comes the prince through the door and sees Paul there and sees his, his fiancée there. 
And you know what Paul does? Kills. Nope. <laughs> Better than that. He shares with them the gospel. And the prince converts and recognizes that he should not, although he and Thelso should get met, will get married, they will not have relations. And they will both remain pure. Story ends. That's the kind of stuff that's floating around in the early church. Because Christians want other people to believe. It's, it'd be entertaining. And they want to draw the people to it. And you look at that and say, oh, that's, that's crazy. Well, how do we present Bible stories to children? We put them in cartoons. Why are we putting them in cartoons? So it's entertaining. It's what they used to. And sometimes it's even not just cartoons of the story, but, you know, I remember, what, about 20 years ago, there was a cartoon called Superbook where you went into the Bible and there was a robot and kids would go to biblical times. and I mean, it was an adventure story. Yeah. That's what they did in the early church to, to make people appreciate Christianity. Okay, that's, so the fact that Luke is writing something, now none of those ended up in the Bible because they were a lot of baloney. They were just stories. You know, this word of God doesn't mean it can't be exciting. Doesn't mean it can't be good. So Rhoda comes, they think it's, it's a lot of hooey. What is Peter doing while they're discussing this? He's still knocking at the door, right? And, and what happens? They, they finally open the gate and they were amazed. see him and they're amazed, which... We know a miracle has happened because that is the standard response to miracles. We saw it all over the place in Luke. When a miracle occurs, people are amazed. And what does Peter do? Told him to be quiet. Okay. To be quiet. To be quiet. And then what does he do for them? He tells the story. He tells them the story, right? Of how the Lord brought him out of prison and then... He says, tell this to James. Tell it to James. Whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't, didn't we just hear that Herod had killed James? Mm -hmm. Huh. Huh, what's going on here? Different James. Different James. What James is this? Who is this James? Jesus' brother. Ah, it's Jesus' brother. Okay. So this is, this is a different James. Now, it says Jesus' brother, uh, Adelphoi, Adelphos. Roman Catholics, that would mean if, if James was Jesus' brother, then Mary had two boys. At least two boys. She had other children. Mm -hmm. Roman Catholics are Roman Catholic brothers and sisters believe that she didn't. The word for, for brother, mm -hmm. Adelpho, Adelphos, can mean, doesn't usually, seldom does it, but it could mean like cousin. Mm -hmm. Could be. Probably doesn't because that's a, that's a very remote use. But that's what they'll say, that he was a cousin of, uh, of Jesus which would make it, make it fine. But it, that's, in terms of the language, that's not the most reasonable way to mm -hmm. translate it. Anyway, they'd, they'd have used another word. Okay, so he conveys this story to this, the group, and then what does he do? Leaves. Okay, he leaves. What happens in the next morning? Again, this is a, good, this is a nice story because it's, you can see scenes. You know, we go from the prison to the street and then to the house, to inside the house. And now Peter's inside the house and, and he leaves. What happens the next morning? Ha, ha, ha. The, um, the guards are scrambling. The guards are scrambling because all of a sudden Peter ain't there, right? And I'll be put to death. 
what does, yeah, speaking of that, what does Herod, who is behind this, right? Because this is going to be the way he's going to be, become really popular, ramp up his popularity with the Jews. What does Herod do? Initially, what does he do? Mm -hmm. Interrogated the guards. Yeah, and, and he's, and he's mm -hmm. looking for... Yeah, he's looking for where he's looking for Peter, and he interrogates the guards. And when he doesn't get anything from the guards, what does he do? Kills him. Okay, he he kills them. And and then where does he go? Caesarea. He goes to Caesarea. Now Herod maintains his court not in Jerusalem. He he lives principally in Caesarea. Why would he live? principally in Caesarea. Why would Herod choose to make that his capital, not Jerusalem? Is it closer to the water? Close to the water. So it's easier to get to Rome. Easier to get to Rome. That was the Roman administrative center. So his, his strength was not with the Jews in Jerusalem. His strength was with the Romans in Caesarea. You know, he needed, the, he needed the Romans as much as they needed him. Uh, Jerusalem was always a problem because it's, it's on a mountain, so it's hard to get to. So if there was problems in Jerusalem, it would be tough for the Romans to get there. You couldn't get there easily. That's why you're gonna have a revolution, that's why they have a revolution, a revolt in 71. And it's hard for the Romans to put it down because Jerusalem is, is such a strategically well-placed city. Okay, so point of the story, what's the point? We got this little story here. Luke must want us to read it, must want his, his audience to, to, to hear it. What becomes the point? What's the point of this little story about Peter? That God will take care of you. Okay, God's going to take care of. If he's writing to a church that's facing some stress, that might be some good news to hear. Church responded to stress by praying. By praying, right? So they uh, and when they heard the story, they passed the story along. Okay, so we got a, a little story again that makes sense if if Luke wants to buck up. His church wants his church to be stronger. Now, we got to change the situation in, in verse 20, right? What's, what's happening in verse 20? We got an interesting little story that Luke includes. What happens, what's going on in verse 20? Because Peter's gone, he's, he's gone somewhere else. What's happening in verse 20? Something with Tyre, Tyre and so. Okay, we got Herod again, right? Yeah. And Herod is angry, right? Mm -hmm. And he's angry with who? Or with whom? The people of Tyre and Sidon. And both Tyre and Sidon are on the coast. They're ports on the coast. Okay, it's part of the Roman Empire. But Herod is angry with them. Uh, what what do they do? Herod's a Herod's, you know, he's a guy to be reckoned with. He's he, the Romans like Herod a lot, you know. So Herod has a lot of power. What do these people do? The people of Tyre and Sidon. He could cause a lot of problems. Now it's outside of his his kingdom, but he could still cause cause difficulties. They got both got their food supply from where Herod from what Herod, Herod ruled. Yeah, they so, need uh, they need Herod to feed yeah, them, right? Yeah. And so, what is their strategy? They go see this guy named Blastus. Yeah, and who is Blastus? He's one of Herod's big guys. Yeah, he's working for Herod. So they they they're going to get to Herod through Blastus. Blastus, right? And and so they're going to meet. They're going to meet him right yeah. on the appointed day when they're supposed to. When this is supposed to come down, right? right. You know what happens? Well, Harold can 
down with his best robe on and starts giving him a speech. Okay. And what is the response when he gives a speech? An angel of the Lord strikes him dead. Well, even before, what, what do the people say? You sound more like God than Herod. You sound more like God than a human being. You, you are speaking the voice of, of God. What are the people doing in front of, of Herod? Didn't. Denying them. They're denying God, right? Yeah. They're not denying Herod. Uh. You know, they sound like they're getting ready to do what? Take up an offering and build a church to Herod, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do we learn about Herod? He ain't so much. He, well, <laughs> he, we know Luke tells us bad thing is going to happen to Herod. Yeah. But Luke makes sure we know why a bad thing happens to Herod. It's not just this how and Herod dies. What does Luke tell us? The people have, have offered him all kinds of praise and adoration. Mm -hmm. What do we learn about him? About him. About Herod. That would explain what happened. Because remember, this is Luke writing it. This isn't anybody saying it. This is Luke writing it as part of the narrative. Mm -hmm. What has Herod not done? in his fancy robes, listening to the people say, as he speaks, and the people respond by saying, You're, you, you speak with the voice of God. What has Herod not done? Oh, give thanks to God. He has not given thanks or glory to God, right? Why is that a problem? Not to give thanks and praise and Glory to God. Because he was enjoying the accolades. And ah. Right. And who's in control? God. God is in control. He is not giving credit where credit is due. due. So what happens to him? Well, he becomes ill. He becomes ill. And it's, it sounds like such a, a nice illness. But after several days of intense pain, he dies. Oh. Yeah. He is, what's happening to him? What does Luke tell us? Well, it becomes worm food. He becomes worm food. I have, I have something different here. What do you got? My verse 23 says, Immediately an angel from the Lord struck Herod down because he didn't give the honor to God. Right. Mm -hmm. He was eaten by worms and died. So that seems like public, like boom, like to me, like the, the, in front of everyone. And this says he had a heart attack and died. Huh. So. Well, that's... This is a... Paraphrase. Right. Um, yeah. I, but yeah, this says one of those. But if he if he is eaten by dies, and let's say he dies right there, because that's the way Luke is kind of phrasing it. He's driving this story, and he's being eaten by worms. Is is that a good way to go? I, I'm not thinking that's a great way to go. He's not dying peacefully in his sleep. Now. And, and why has this happened to Herod? Because he didn't give credit to God. Because he didn't give credit to God. Didn't give glory to God. Now, have we seen this happen before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, boy. When did we see it happen before? Oh, when they sold their land. Yes! Land when they sold to the guy, sold Anna, sold his land. And didn't give credit, didn't give the, the community its share. And what happened to him? When he eaten by dogs. Well, he wasn't eaten by dogs. That was Didn't that was uh, Jezebel was eaten by no, dogs. Wasn't it just gone? Like, what's it well, like? he he um, or fell immediately. He too. fell and he burst open. Uh, oh. Luke Luke liked this burst and open business. Um, uh, the um, the. That's that the the guy who didn't sell his, give credit to, uh -huh. to sell his, he did just die. It didn't because they carried him away. Mm -hmm. But somebody fell and his guts burst open. Who was that? He bought a field and he fell and his guts got scattered all over the. In fact, they named the field field of blood. 
Who was that that fell in it? That isn't Luke the great physician. Well, I mean, is that not his nickname? Well, yeah, yeah, that's that's something attributed to it. So maybe he's putting these gory things in there so that uh, his who, medical portion. Who it. who did it? Who who had his gut spread over a field in chapter one? We know him. We've heard his name. We've talked about him before. Oh, Judas. Judas. You know, Judas. Uh, and, and Matthew, Judas goes and hangs himself. Luke, he falls and his guts splatter all over a field. More satisfying. More satisfying. More... <laughs> better story. Better story. More dramatic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stronger reminder of... Don't you better not fool around with God. You better give God the glory and thanks and honor God deserves, or you're going to be eaten by worms or splattered over a field. Think about that, Ed, when you're surveying a field. <laughs> yeah, really. All right, now this... Luke, though, doesn't want to end with this little story with a downer, right? Mm -hmm. Because what does he sort of tack on to the end? Barnabas and Saul return to Jerusalem. Oh, and what's happening? Yeah. The word grows. The, the word is growing and advancing, and you've got more converts. And you've got who going to Jerusalem? John and surname. The okay. surname was Mark. Yeah, you got John Mark. With them, but who is it that goes to Jerusalem? Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul. Yeah, Antioch from Jerusalem. Barnabas and Saul, which means that, in terms of status, Barnabas is still on top. Barnabas is still on top. It's still, you know, Barnabas and friend. Who's Simeon? Uh, is that still? Who's Simeon? Well, wait a minute. Is that Barnabas, the Barnabas that was released? No, it wouldn't be the one that was released for, G for Jesus, was it? No, that was Barabbas. Barabbas. Yeah. I mean, his yeah. name's just too close. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, when we said Barabbas, Barabbas is a weird name. Yeah. Because it literally means son of a, son of a father, which sounds fishy. Uh, that doesn't sound like a real name. And I, I don't know that that's way, I think that's intentional. I think mm -hmm. he... You know, they would rather have anybody than, than Jesus, Jesus, you know. Really. So, uh, any son of a father, mm -hmm. uh, which is every man. But no, this is, this is a different Barnabas. And, and, but he's, he still has. We're going to see that change. And the listing will become Paul and Barnabas when the status, status changes. The Supremes are going to become Diana Ross. And the it Supremes. and the Supremes. That's exactly right. And then it's going to become Diana Ross. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, yeah, Barnabas will become the pips. Uh, <laughs> no, but John Mark is, is with him. Now, and again, John Mark doesn't have much role, mm -hmm. but he will. Mm -hmm. He will later. Now, just, just as an aside, and then we'll finish, we're finished up. Um, this Mark when, is not the evangelist, Mark. Mark. The, the, no indication that it would be anywhere close to being the evangelist, Mark. Well, um, so many names. Well, you know, <laughs> when you think about it, you know, there's still a lot of people living. Yeah. To say there's only one guy named Mark in the entire world, yeah. and that's, that, that's unlikely. Uh, a lot of times they'll associate, though, uh, they'll, they'll name, originally the Gospels had no name mm -hmm. associated with it. Names for the Gospels didn't come until later. And if you've got a Gospel, if I've got a Gospel, I want you to read because I think it, it should change your life. Then I'm not going to give it the name, the Gospel according to Ed. Because you're going to look at it and say, who the heck is Ed? Mm. You know, who the heck is Ed? And what the heck is he doing writing the Gospel? Mm -hmm. If I want you to read the Gospel, I'm going to say this gospel was written by Sam. Am I going to say Sam? <laughs> Heck no. no. Who am I going to say it was written by? 
Take me, right? <laughs> well, if I say, I've got this gospel I wrote mm -hmm. here, the gospel according to Ed, are you going to read that? Does that have in white on the bottom the job description? Uh-uh. But if I print in white on the bottom of that, on the bottom of that application, Matthew mm -hmm. or John or Peter, mm -hmm. if I say this is a gospel of Peter, not the gospel of Ed. There's some weight to that. There you got weight. And so when they started attributing names, that's mm -hmm. what they tended to do. Uh, if Mark, if Mark, this Mark had written the Gospel of Mark, you, since Mark and Paul uh, will eventually travel, you'd expect to see Mark, the way Mark writes his Gospel would reflect Paul's ideas, and it doesn't at all. Mark doesn't reflect Paul at all. Luke doesn't reflect Paul at all. So unlikely that Paul influenced either one of them because the theology of of the Gospel of Mark, or, or certainly Luke and Acts, is not Paulinian at all. In fact, it's very different. So you'd have to question. That, that's one of the things you, you wonder. How, how could that be and it'd be so different? Okay, so we've got writing to this church. We've got a story of Peter. Now, like I said, Peter is going to... He's going to fail you. Mm -hmm. Because the gospel is doing what? Moving out. Moving out. But, Moving out. But he's done his job. Like I was just thinking about it, where Peter was for Jerusalem, because how we're talking about how he always ties it back to scripture and speaks a language that the Jews, that the people of Jerusalem are going to understand, where when it moves to the next phase, someone like Paul, Saul Paul, is more suited because those scripture references are going to go Don't right matter. out of their head. Me has, you know, and that's a that's a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, even when Paul, and this is this is what's fascinating with Luke, mm -hmm. uh, when Paul is in Athens, mm -hmm. he's going to uh, and very educated mm -hmm. city. Um, he's going to use references that are pagan mm -hmm. in his sermon, which is fascinating. You know, he doesn't use Old Testament. Although uh, a lot of what Paul will, there's going to be a commonality. You know, he's not going to be doing a radically different message because the people in Jerusalem think he's doing a good job. Mm -hmm. They like what he's doing. Now, historically, when you read Paul's letters, they aren't happy with it. You know, there's all kinds of tension between Paul and the people from Jerusalem. Uh, that they are causing him major trouble. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of tension going on. So, you know, what's actually happening, Luke is trying to present a church that works mm -hmm. because he wants his church to work. And so that's, that's the illustration he gives. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and then um, go. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. Uh, help, help us to remember that, that you are in control, that behavior has consequences, but also that you're leading us forward. And even when things get difficult and challenging, you haven't given up on, on us. Help us not to give up on you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen.